In today's video, I'm going to be showing my top tips on how you can do well in GCSE Biology and we're looking at AQ8, particularly Paper 1. So I'm going to share with you the thought process I go through when I look at questions and therefore help you score the highest marks possible. So starting with question 2.4, this is tobacco mosaic virus. Don't worry, they've actually told you that in the question above. So that is tobacco mosaic virus. And the crucial thing here is says that TMV can cause plants to produce less chlorophyll. This causes leaf discoloration. Explain why plants with TMV have stunted growth. And it's worth four marks. So use your highlighter to point out the key bits of the question. We've got stunted growth and we have that as a result of less chlorophyll. So we need to ask ourselves, well, where do we find chlorophyll? We find it in chloroplasts. And when you were learning the functions of the different organelles inside a plant cell, you'll hopefully have learned that chloroplasts are key for photosynthesis, which is good because that's a key scientific word. What does photosynthesis actually do? Well, it takes carbon dioxide and water plus light energy and transfers it into glucose plus oxygen. I'm just going to balance that now. Now, which part of this equation could have something to do with growth? That is the glucose, because remember, the glucose is used to make fats and oils and proteins. All of which are constituents of plants and are therefore involved in the plant growth. So effectively, this answer, we're providing four marks. We don't want to keep repeating ourselves. We need to just point out some very key scientific facts. But the real skill here is just identifying which part of the specification we're actually looking at. But let's first of all make a comment saying that TMV causes plants to have less chloroplasts. As a result, the plants can't photosynthesize as much. What did I say next? Well, less glucose would be made, meaning that fewer proteins and oils are synthesized. You can say made, by the way. With biology, you don't need to be too complex with your English language. I just didn't want to keep saying the word made. The TMV therefore causes stunted growth. Okay, this is a long mark question. 3.2, in 2014, the Ebola virus killed almost 8,000 people in Africa. Drug companies have developed a new drug to treat Ebola. Explain what testing must be done before this new drug can be used to treat people and it's worth six marks. This is quite a nice question. It doesn't really rely on you understanding too much. It's a fact recall question. So if you've learned all the steps involved in drug testing, then you should do quite well here. So we need to go from having a chemical which has proven, which is proven to have a positive effect on treating Ebola and we need to take that all the way through various trials in order to actually make it suitable for public use. So we're kind of going from a chemical that tends to be isolated from plants and taking it all the way through to the drug that we actually provide for public use. Now, you can't just go giving people plants which haven't been manufactured correctly because lots of plants have lots of side effects. Aspirin, for example, which really originates from willow bark, which is a type of tree. Now, before aspirin was properly made, people just used to chew on willow bark, which was great because it decreased pain, which was what aspirin is actually used for, but it caused massive issues with intestinal bleeding. So that's part of the reason why you can't just go giving people plants. So what do we need to do to develop new drugs? Well, we need to test, and there's lots of different tests. There are the preclinical tests, and the clinical tests. And as part of our answer, we're gonna describe these in great amounts of detail. So firstly, we're gonna say preclinical drug trials must be carried out. Why is that? Well, that's in order to determine any toxicity issues. And that basically means poisoning. And notice that preclinical drug trials tend to be carried out, this is really cruel, but on either animals or just isolated cells. So not humans. Following on from this, we're going to carry out clinical trials, and clinical just means involving humans. And you tend to find that people volunteer because they pay, get paid quite a lot of money to test out new drugs. And the crucial thing here is that they're healthy. 
and we're really looking for side effects here. So you're not going to get poisoned in the way you potentially might be with preclinical drug trials but you can still get some pretty unpleasant side effects. So some drugs will give you diarrhea as a side effect. So they need to work out if those side effects are acceptable or not. And then there are different types of clinical trials. Remember, you have to do blind trials because you don't want the volunteer to know if they're being given the drug or not, because a lot of people will ha have experienced the placebo effect, which is when they're given effectively a sugar pill, the volunteer feels better because it's all in their mind. So really what you want to do is carry out a double blind trial where neither the volunteer or the doctor knows who's been given the drug. The double blind trials prevent bias. Neither the doctor or volunteer knows who's been given the drug. And there's an extra mark for stating what a placebo is, so I'm going to add that here. A placebo is a sugar pill which does not contain the drug. Six point five. Celiac disease is a disease of the digestive system. It damages the lining of the small intestine when foods that contain gluten are eaten. So this this is quite an information packed question. So celiac disease is a disease of the digestive system, it causes damage to the lining of the small intestine when gluten is eaten. When people with celiac disease eat foods that contain gluten, their immune system forms antibodies. These antibodies attack the lining of the small intestine and it causes damages to the villi. Symptoms of celiac disease include poor growth. Suggest why a person with celiac disease might have this symptom. This is quite a nice question. Okay, it's worth four marks. Again, we're going to make four separate points. There's a lot of information actually provided in the question. We really need to ask ourselves, what do villi do? And remember, they increase the surface area available for absorption of nutrients. So obviously, if they get damaged, then you're going to absorb fewer nutrients. And then what, are those, what sort of nutrients are we talking about? Well, we're talking about glucose. So very similar to the first question. We're talking about amino acids. And these are needed to build proteins. So we build fewer proteins needed to build storage compounds such as glycogen. And then crucially, the one extra thing you can point out with glucose is the fact that it is that glucose is needed in respiration, remember. So these are all symptomatic of having celiac disease, but there is a lot of information in the question. So now we're going to write out our full answer. So let's state the first thing I wrote out, which is the antibodies damage the villi, meaning that there is a reduced surface area, fewer nutrients, e.g. glucose and amino acids are absorbed. This means that fewer proteins are built. And we could even add a point here saying that protein is essential for muscle growth. And by writing that, we're definitely answering this bit about why the person with celiac disease might have this symptom. And then lastly, say glucose is needed in aerobic respiration. So less energy is released. Explain how the human circulatory system is adapted to supply oxygen to the tissues, remove waste products from the tissues. So really what we need to do is identify what the human circulatory system is, and that is the heart and blood vessels. And if we zoom in on blood, then we're talking about red blood cells, and they'll become important because of the need to supply oxygen to the tissues. And then things like plasma, which is also found inside the blood, will become important when we're looking at the removal of waste products from the tissue. So we're going to start by chatting about the human circulatory system and saying what it is, giving quite a lot of detail there. And then we're going to talk about how we can actually supply oxygen to the tissues and remove waste products from the tissues.
let's just quickly remind ourselves of the structure of the heart. So if I draw it as a simple box, we've got the left atrium and the right atrium. Remember, they're flipped because of the way in which the heart is in your body. You've got the left ventricle and the right ventricle. The vessels supplying the heart are veins. Because this vessel here is coming from the lungs, we call it the pulmonary vein. Because this vessel is coming from the rest of the body, it's the vena cava or vena cava. This is an artery taking oxygenated blood around the body, so it's the aorta. And this is an artery taking blood back to the lungs for oxygenation, which is why it's the pulmonary artery. And the last point is that we actually have a double circulatory system, which remember is when the blood is pumped into the heart twice for every once it travels around the body. And the real reason is so that the high blood pressure can be maintained to ensure that there's a greater blood flow to the tissues, which is good because it means we'll be supplying more oxygen. So let's get started. So a double circulatory system means that blood flows at a higher pressure so that more oxygenated blood can be delivered to tissues. How do we actually get that blood oxygenated? Well, we're going to write that the pulmonary artery delivers deoxygenated blood to the lungs where it can be oxygenated. T talking more about the blood now, so remember that the blood contains red blood cells which have haemoglobin and a biconcave dish shape because remember red blood cells look a bit like a donut, this sort of thing. And this increases the surface area to volume ratio so they can actually carry as much oxygen as possible. looking at the second bullet point that we need to answer so we're removing waste products from the tissues well how do those waste products leave the tissues in the first place it's along small blood vessels called capillaries and these capillaries have a large surface area and it's worth talking about what sort of waste substances we're looking at and that includes urea which is a breakdown product of proteins and carbon dioxide, which is obviously produced by respiring cells. So.